and we go. All right, Warriors, welcome to the Knee Pain Clinic led by your host, Coach Josh. Uh, today we're going to talk about knees. What are they? How do they work? Um, I'm not kidding. We're going to talk about knee function, knee anatomy. We're going to talk about the most common knee injuries and how to fix them. And the knees are uh, just like most of the body, there's, there's, there's some complexity to it, but I'm going to break it down into its simplest parts today so that you have an idea of what the knee looks and feels like and what are the common problems that, uh, that go awry. Now, I'm not going to cover all of the things that can happen on a knee. This is a one hour course, not a 10 day lecture. But the, at the end of the, the movements and at the end of the seminar or clinic, you can ask all the questions you want about any specific surgeries. You might have experience, or people in your life might have experience, so you can get any details about specific examples at that time. So, um, let's begin by just talking about knee anatomy. All right. The knee is the joint that sits between the lower leg and the upper leg. The upper leg is the femur. The lower leg is the tibia and, and fibula. Fibia. Tibula. Thank you, fibula. And uh, <clears throat> the, the kneecap, the, the, the thing that most of us associate with a knee joint and specifically knee pain, is the patella. It's just a, a, a floating piece of bone that rides in between these joints. And it sits in a groove called the trochlear notch or fossa or whatever it is. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for the purposes of the lecture, but it floats in this little groove at the end of your femur. And uh, to the degree that it moves perfectly up and down underneath the patellar tendon, uh, that's the degree that your knee functions pretty well. The knee is a dumb joint, and a dumb joint has only one function. And the knee can do some other things, but really it's only supposed to bend in one direction to allow, you, to allow your gait, to allow you to run, jump, and, um, and walk. So, uh, I'm going to quote a, a great uh, physical therapist named uh, Hartman. His first name is, but, uh, uh, so Hartman out of the Indianapolis uh, uh, Functional Anatomy something or other, I fast. Um, he, he helped us define alternating joint theory, which is just that joints are surrounded by things that do the opposite. So your wrist is highly mobile, elbow only bends in one direction, shoulders highly mobile, Scapula thoracic only does a few things, barely moves, right? And I, nice, now that you see it, you can't unsee it. That's pretty cool. So below the knee, you have a highly mobile ankle joint that can do almost anything, 360 degree ball and socket joint. Then you've got the most mobile joint in the body and the most powerful, the hip. And they're extremely related. Not so much the ankle and the knee, but the hip and the knee. Um, they say that the hip is the grandfather of all all maladies in orthopedics because the hip can compensate and create any problem in the, in the body. So if I have a knee issue, I can borrow a range of motion from my hip and it will accommodate. So I can get by and I can create a, a nearly stable gait by borrowing from the hip instead of the knee or borrowing from the hip instead of the low back. So because of this accommodation, the hip often it will tell you what's going on with the joints around it. So we're going to talk a little bit about hip anatomy and how that relates to the function of the knee, which is coming up next. So we've got some anatomy, right? Big bone in the upper leg, two small bones in the lower leg. Common, uh, the, all the muscles of the, the front of the leg connect to the common patellar tendon, come down and attach to the, the front of the lower leg. And then you've got three muscles of the hamstring, biceps, femoris, semitendinosus, and the third one, whatever it is. Not really matter. We'll get into the, how the hamstrings uh, effect the knee pretty soon. So we're talking about knee anatomy. Now we just started talking about the function of the knee. So as a dumb joint having one role, the knee flexes and extends, right? It flexes and extends varying degrees of power based on what you're doing. So <clears throat> almost all problems of the knee are come about when the knee is asked to do something that it can't do. So if the knee can only flex and extend, then that means any sort of lateral movement, any ro any torsion or rotation is going to damage that joint. So uh, the most common injuries to the uh, to the knee are ligament injuries. That's any lateral movement is essentially going to cause a ruptured ligament. Medial collateral, lateral collateral, collateral are really common in sports because you're often doing fast breaks, locking out your leg and then moving it, or in that order, not in that order, but. 
Anytime you ask that joint to do something that it's not supposed to do, you're going you're gonna to receive damage. So <clears throat> the, the injury, this ties right into the kind of injuries that you get. The injury is patellofemoral pain syndrome is just the name for having an achy knee. So a lot of times you'll get diagnosed with PFP, yeah, PFPS because the provider, they're, they're not an orthopedist and they don't know what caused it, but they know what's happening now. It's just you have an achy knee. Um, after the, this is going to be the umbrella diagnosis, right? But the most common injuries are uh, tendonitis of the patellar tendon, which we're about to talk about, and then ligament damage and meniscus tears. So the, the tendonitis aspect of um, patellar femoral pain syndrome is whenever there's a, a tension on the anterior portion of the leg, the the muscles, muscles are very adaptable. They can stretch and contract and they can adjust in real time and they do it all the time when we're walking. The body adjusts itself and moves. Tendons, however, cannot. So if I increase the amount of tension on my quad, the quad contracts. The, the tendon is stretched based on that new position of the quad and the tendon can't relax until the quad relaxes. So it cannot shorten and it cannot take the stress off its own, um, the, the, the structure of the tendon until you shorten those muscles. And the same thing applies for the muscles below the knee as well. So when you have patellar tendonitis, it's also called jumper's knee. You have an accumulation of tension and called you know, micro tears is the old language. I don't know what they're calling it these days. You have the accumulation of damage to that tendon that hasn't been able to repair. And no amount of like static stretching and, um, and, and adjustments is going to correct and allow that tendon to repair itself. Only time. Specifically, time without the increased tension. Time where that quad can relax or uh, the musculature of the lower leg. You have to take the pressure off. Just imagine a, a pulley, right? The ropes are the muscles. The pulley itself is the tendon. You have to sl put slack into those ropes so that the, the pulley is not being grabbed as hard, right? So there's force going through that as well. So you have to take some tension off that patellar tendon. And the only way to do that is um, myofascial release on a daily basis because again, just one dose of it might make it feel better, but it's like it's going to take days and maybe weeks to fully heal. Correct. Right. So patellar tendonitis, jumper's knee, right? The, the, the things that contribute to uh, uh, that accumulation of tension and pain, sitting pretty much all, I mean, even standing can do it, right? Because you're just... You're loading a few fibers of the quad and, and adhesions build up. Adhesions change the way that you recruit the, that tissue, recruit those fibers, and then they, they change the way that you use your body when you want to move it. So you have to move through a full, full range of motion consistently and do some sort of tissue quality work on yourself. It doesn't have to be a lot, but without that sort of maintenance, you're just going to accumulate stress on the quads, shorten the hip flexors, and uh, continue to, to increase that pressure on the patellar tendon. So tendonitis is really easy to get and it takes a while to get to let go of. So if you're feeling pain when you're doing that, you know, anything that flexes the knee, so squatting, jumping, running, that you, you have to begin a protocol and keep on it for at least three weeks typically because tendons heal about seven times more slow, slowly than muscle fibers. Muscle fiber, if you tear a muscle fiber, it's going to be repaired in three days if you're really old, maybe ten days. Okay? But that's not a long time. If you, if you sprain an ankle, a tear a tendon, or a ligament, it's going to take weeks, right? possibly months to recover. Because right? the blood flow is lower, it doesn't have cellular turnover the way muscles do. So, when you're taking care of your body, you have to understand that there's increased healing times in all of these, all of these symptoms. Now, that's patellar uh, femoral pain syndrome related to tendonitis. Ligament and meniscus tears, they can both present similarly to tendonitis, but um, usually you're gonna feel it a little bit deeper inside the knee joint and maybe even to the side. And uh, these, the ligament damage that occurs here, uh, whether it's a meniscus tear or uh, you know, a ligament tear, uh, usually there's, they're event related. And in the case of, like, so if you're playing soccer, and you're running, and you're in a field somewhere in Portland, and you take a deep step, and you drop into a little pothole, just that four inches of drop, you're not gonna land perfectly. It's gonna create a lateral stress on the locked out joint, and that's gonna damage the ligament. Right? That's one of the most common ways to either get hip bursitis or ligament tears. 
And <clears throat> usually you'll know when you pop a ligament that you're going to hear a pop like a rubber band snapping. Right? Um, and if you, if you feel that and then your knee swells up, then pretty obvious, right? The, the times when you damage the ligaments where it's not event oriented is if you are a very mobile person. So if you have naturally mobile uh, joints, and there's a rock a bottle test we're going to take after this lecture portion so you can tell who, if that's you. But if you have naturally mobile ligaments, what will happen is, even when your knees are locked out, that joint is still not secure. So doing, you know, uh, playing, playing sports, even things that aren't, you don't have any impact, you're slowly degrading and laterally loading that, that limb over time. And over the course of months and years of that, you're wearing out those ligaments and they just get more and more lax and then they tear. Uh, or even if they don't tear, they can still cause pain, they can be partially torn. So that's the longer, slower death. The faster death is event-oriented, which usually people know. They got hit in a game of basketball, someone fell on their, you know, they you know, kicked them or something like that, and there's a pop, or they jumped up, you know, and, and came down for the rebound and then blew their knee. You know, that's, that's usually the experience that people are, are thinking about when talking about ligated damage. And meniscus tear is the same thing. Usually it's overuse and uh, impact-related. And um, the reason is, is whenever you're loading a limb and you try to change directions, which is almost always what we're doing on our feet, um, that's where the connective tissue is very vulnerable. So, that's why we, we talked about knee function before knee injury, because if the knee is only meant to do this, yet we're relying on it all day long to do all kinds of cool stuff, right? Like, the almost all of the tasks that we're asking it to do could damage it. So, it's not if, it's when. If you're a professional basketball player or if you're a, a, a hobbyist, um, ultimate frisbee player, or, or, uh, or even tennis, especially tennis, actually, eventually you're going to have some damage to your knees. There's a prophylactic and there's a cure, and they're very closely related. Um, well, then that comes to me correct. So, if, if lateral movements are what causes the damage to um, to knees. How do we how do we prevent and restore knee stability? Strengthen the muscles around. Strengthen the muscles and move laterally, right? And there are things that that nobody is good at and nobody wants to do because that's not really we're we're sagittal plane creatures. We, we we work in front of us. We we don't really think about things like rotational drills, and nobody I've ever met likes to do a lateral lunge. Like, <laughs> nobody I've ever met. But, do you like this? I am. You're the one. <laughs> wow. You <laughs> the thing you that, like torture? The, the thing that damages the joint is the thing that, that he heals it, right? So strengthening that, that knee in the bent position because uh, the, the knee, once it's bent, is no longer relying on those ligaments. It's relying on the musculature from the hip, right? The IT band, the hamstring and quads. Now, you're allowing that force to be preloaded in all of the, the mm -hmm. muscle fibers that protect the, the knee and the hip in, in lateral movement. So if you're playing basketball, you want to keep your knees bent. If you're, you know, if you're sprinting or if you're doing anything where you're going to have to make a sudden twist, Bending the knees, that's why we practice on deceleration a lot training four years. Keeping the knees bent when you're increasing the force or changing direction is what keeps you safe. And you have to be really, 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 really strong because when you change directions, when you're tired, that's when you want to be lazy. And you can see it in yourself. If you're ever doing line drills or lunges or anything like that, you aim like you know you're at the end, you just, you'll, you'll plant and you won't even bend the knee. You just plant, uh, you know, and, and you tire, right? So that's, we all, I mean, like the brain is naturally designed to conserve calories. So we're trying to, to keep that, um, we're keeping that instinct at bay. So training with a bent knee, training in these lateral planes of motions, and doing it with low risk activities. The correctives that we're going to do today, we're going to start with stability drills when we're going to do a little assessment. Then we're going to start with uh, stability drills, then we're going to do mobility drills, then we're going to do strengthening drills. And we're going to progress it so that you can see kind of where your own personal limitations are and what, um, and what you can do to take yourself to the next level to prevent that kind of injury. Whew. Covered a lot of ground in like nine minutes, so we're doing great. <clears throat> so, thus far, we've, we've talked about knee structures and the anatomy. 
We talked about knee function. We talked about you know what, what its role is. Knee injuries, patellofemoral pain syndrome, ligament and meniscus tears, and patellar tendonitis. All, all essentially all occurring with, besides patellar tendonitis, all occurring because of lateral stresses to the knee. Um, and we'll talk about even how that applies to tendonitis. Actually, we'll probably talk about that right now. Well, because the stronger your glutes are and hamstrings, the more, the less pressure there is on that quad. That uh, the glutes and hamstrings protect the pelvis, or protect the knee by tilting the pelvis back, taking pressure off your low back anyway, but they protect the, the knee by forcing the quad to be in a lengthened position, to force that quad to relax a little bit more. It's like, um, if I have a tight tricep and I flex my bicep, the tricep is forced to relax or tear. So when my glute gets stronger, it tilts the pelvis back and the quad has to relax or tear. And we want it to, at least to some degree, relax a little bit. It still has plenty of resting time, it still has lots of stability, has lots of stability to the pelvis. But by creating balance there, we're taking or intrinsically taking the stress out. <coughs> Simple and effective. So that's how it relates to tendonitis. <clears throat> the correctives we're about to get into once we do our assessment. Covered a lot of ground. There was a lot of just stuff. Anybody have any questions or anything we're talking about? Should right. I get my tennis shoes out of my car? Yeah, if you want to move, yeah, you probably do. Cool. So um, am I correct in thinking that there's no strengthening ligaments? There's strengthening muscles and like not and then taking care of your ligaments? Kind of. Kind of. So, um, one of the things, like, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how it works for tendons, and then the connective tissue is not the same, but it's very similar to ligaments. Okay. So, so, like, when we're doing strength training in here, we don't, you'll notice that the volume, if you're looking at our, our program online, the volume of reps that we do that is less than six is, is not very much. Because in those high, in those low rep ranges where the where the weight is really high, the torque is also the highest. Those are what really stresses out the tendons and the ligaments. And that stress is good because you need that stress to be able to anchor your muscles so that next time around you can recruit more force through them. But there, we need to strategically load at different times of the month so that we allow those tendons lots of time to recover. Right? Um, ligaments are very much the same. Um, you by doing good strength training, you can prepare them, right, for stresses. However, if you're not strength training in the lateral planes, you're probably not correctly loaded. I was gonna lead off with this quote, um, or a story about Ryan Flaherty. Does everybody, anybody watch football here? Anybody football fan? Well, good, that's actually make it, makes it easier. <clears throat> Robert Griffin III is a NCAA track star, who was Kansas City Chiefs, I think it was, He's a young quarterback, one of those really, really fast quarterbacks. Well, he's a track star. And uh, the Nike speed trainer, Ryan Flaherty, who's just a very, very creative, minimalist trainer, um, was really smart. They, they were, he was on a podcast. This was right when RGB was taking the field. And um, he was talking about watching RGB train. And he said, I think his career is going to be over in four or five years most. And like, whoa, he hasn't even played a game yet. You're just like calling it? And he said, and he didn't go into it why then, but RGB's career ended pretty fast. And he, um, and he was interviewed again. And so like, hey, you quoted, you, you saw this coming. Like, what, what cued you in on that? He's like, oh yeah, well, I was watching this trainer's Instagram and I was watching how they were training. And he's a powerful, very sagittal, plain athlete who's fast. So, and he was doing big, heavy, deep squats and like just doing traditional track and field strength training. Um, which makes him really explosive. He's like, but I didn't see any lateral stability going on, and this athlete has never had to be laterally stable because he's just sprinting. And so football is a game played in the lateral plane. It's, a, it's not a north-south game, it's an east-west game. And he's like, he's like, he's gonna get out of the pocket because he's really fast, and he's gonna get hit all the time and from the side. And so he's like, it's only a matter of time before that athlete goes down. And he went down, I think it's like first, he had a knee injury his second season, it came back in the third season, and then it was over. And the uh, and the and he's like he's like, yeah, I mean like I could you have prevented it? Who knows, right? You 
it's hard to prevent a 250 pound guy from blowing your knee out from the side, right? But like, um, he's like, I would have done a lot more. I would have almost focused only on lateral stability because he's so powerful. He's such a great athlete. He didn't need to, to get faster. He was already real fast. Um, but I bring that story up is because this is stuff that is knowable. It's preventable. And not every injury is preventable, right? But it's knowable and you can work against it. You can lead against it. So that's the, that is the, um, that's the mechanism that we're working against today. Or we don't want any more Robert Griffin thirds. We want to be prepared for uh, for what life is going to throw at us. So that's how we're that's what we're gaming out today. All right. So we are going to get uh, we're, we're going to do a little assessment. You got shoes on? Okay, good. We're going to do an assessment of mobility, and then we're going to start with some stability drills for the hip. The thing we're going to focus on the hip because the hip is what actually creates that muscular stability for the knee talking about. So we're going to do stability drills for the for the knee. Then we're going to do mobility drills because you have to stabilize before you mobilize. And then after mobility drills we're going to do some strength drills. And you're going to see how to progress, regress it, and uh, what success looks like for working against knee pain. Alright? Awesome. So we're going to take a short break and then we're going to get moving.